there are various questions there that account for that problem. I would say, I would say, I would say one is the yeah, capital response. Another thing, the strategy they selected is that probably one of the reasons and why you see that the Zapatistas probably are not experiencing the same setbacks or the Ecuadorian just because they are more modern. So it's a difficult, just like the authoritarian question, <coughs> it depends on the context. It's very difficult to say. And, but I do agree that there's always gonna be some capital backlash against this. So the point that this is difficult for me because you almost fall into conspiracy theory. So for example, in Chile during the 70s, corporate prices collapsed and this turned the country into, and then in the 2000s you see the oil prices collapse and Venezuela, so it's like, to what extent that's just an outcome of the commodity cycle, to what extent it's almost like manufactured by capital to try to undermine the project. To me it's almost, it's a mystery, but we will know in the future when the declassified documents come up. <laughs> um, the question of unequal exchange and of independent development. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that unequal exchange is not still operative. My point is that even though it still happens, that's why you have a like, you know Walmart ship goods here that people can buy even with low wages. My point is that it cannot account for the world economic differentia differentiation we're seeing because it's a advanced economies still have income standards that are way above most of the third world, but that has been happening alongside a long-term decline. So it's like they are like still on top, but always declining profitability. Uh, unemployment, high w uh, wages. So you can say the persistence of the North-South divide, maybe closing the gap a little bit, maybe not. Alongside a constant long-term decline of the economic structures of the core. So it's like uneven development explains that almost paradoxical situation where you do have the persistence of the divide, but not in the same way as before, where people will portray almost like two hours going in a different opposition. Position like the, the poor are going rich and rich and the, poor, the very very poor are poor. Now it's like almost they're closing the gap, but both are going down. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that, that's what I'm trying to do. Like what can account for that almost paradoxical situation where you have people talking about the long-term decline, like Robert Brenner and all the guys who talk about the long-term crisis of the advanced economies, alongside that there's still yeah a persistent north-south divide. So my point is that nautical exchange cannot explain all of that. It can explain part. because I also found very interesting your presentation, Roberto, because I think it's a very like important project to rethink or question you know, like these like con almost commonsensical assumptions about corporate or unequal exchange uh, and dependency and so forth. And well, what, what I wanted to ask you, and you know, like picking up on this question, is you know, like in terms of you know, like what does this mean for you know, like political strategy and, and you know, like idioms of political resistance in Latin America specifically? <coughs> it has forged itself like political <coughs> resistance in Latin America has been forged through an idea of anti-imperialism. So, <coughs> right? So, so does this mean, be, as some authors claim, that you know, like imperialism is ideology? I mean, that, that it does not exist. And that we should, you know, like be more concerned towards, you know, like abolishing the wage system, or you know, like is is the anti-imperialist struggle like continue to be a relevant, uh, you know, like political strategy, or is it, you know, like a debilitating? I, I would like to know your take on it. Yeah. As you can see, I never mentioned the word the word imperialism, but I think it's still a word. It's a different category itself. But on even development, the way they describe it, you could see it as a new manifestation of the imperialism that Lenin talked about. They talk about like when economies in the advanced world reach some kind of like saturation of their markets, they export capital. So this new and even development you can see as almost like a 21st century version of that in different ways, but it's still imperialist. So I never, I didn't say the word, because sometimes as people associate it with unequal exchange or with the other, but I think it's still important. Mm -hmm. My concern with the left wing strategy against that is like, it's difficult because granted all this is happening, you might agree or not, <laughs> Mm, for me, the question is that it does not necessarily follow that if you take over the state and implement controls, everything would get better. Mm -hmm. It might get better in the long run, but in the short run, it might get really bad. Mm -hmm. So you might go for a curve where it's like getting really bad and then get better, or you might do it different. So it's, the question of strategy to me remains open. My point is like I cannot derive from what I said almost like a program. I can say like some things I know that doesn't work, but it's yeah, it's almost impossible to say what would work. It depends on like correlation of forces, how big the mass movement is really is, what are the goals. So it depends on so many things. One thing we'll say, you know, there's no, there's no automatic mechanisms. There's no like capital controls that will 
solve this. There's no like uh, exchange uh, currency exchange regime that will solve this. It's like those are mechanisms that might work if you have the political power, or they just open the door for corruption and manipulation if you have if you have a very weak state. So it depends on many other things that I I cannot basically derive from this very abstract model. I can explain what are the problems, the solutions. They have to be constructed like depending on the context. Civics, yes. I'm just wondering if there's, is there a deeper pathology to ruling classes as they Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and what does that tell us about the future? I mean, we we're talking about green capitalism earlier, but this seems much, a much more likely outcome of a just, you know, hmm. fiddling while Rome burns times a thousand. And then Alejandro, uh, this is a magnificent paper as well. Um, a lot of times when I give versions of the end of cheap nature talk, Radical audiences, they're like, no, capitalism is resilient. Capitalism can survive. <laughs> Look, and with the question of water, I mean, we see this in Mexico, all over the place in Mexico. We see this in the American Southwest. We see this in California. I mean, California's out of water. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the centers of cash crop agriculture in the world is out of water. You know, they're digging, digging those holes down another 10, 20, 30 feet every single year. Um, this. This suggests something to me powerful that suggests the end of cheap water, climate change, nexus around capitalism's resilience that is powerful and suggests maybe not so resilient after all. Oh yeah, is this a story about the pathology of ruling classes? Absolutely, right? And, and just, I mean, to go back just a second, you know, why is this, this delinkage from landowning classes? In Latin American literature, from the 19th century onward can be read, I think, productively as a, you know, uh, a literature about precisely these kinds of transitions. The interesting thing is, is precisely in the ISI period, you have these landowners, they become industrialists, right? That's no longer a possibility. It's absolutely no longer a possibility in, in, in Latin America, right? Even though you know, the, the kind of the way that um, neoliberalism was sold in El Salvador was that lots of maquilas are gonna come, right? And so mm -hmm. there was an attempt to, to make that kind of leap. Um, but it just, it didn't happen, right? So what is there? What is at hand? It's the financial sector, right? But, and, and you know, is this a vision of, I think you were kind of getting at, is this what is in store, right? I mean, is, the future, is this it's the story the of the future. American ruling class? I think so, yeah. yeah. Where, and, you know, and it's a different oligarchy. It's not a landowning oligarchy. It's not, you know, coffee families. It's, you know, real estate tycoons and their ilk, right? Um, so yeah, I think, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> 
Um, well, yes, um, I'm glad you asked that because I had a whole section on that, but I couldn't get to it, so that's why I finished up in early. But yeah, I think um, there is there is um, the same problem in Mexico City. I'm going to frame it first within within Mexico City, and then I'll try to make something a bit more uh, structural about it. So in in Lerma, which was built in the 50s, and the wells are now drying up. Uh, sometimes people hit mud when they are trying to drill in a hole. So it's, it's almost depleted. Um, then in the 70s, they built the Kutsamala, which is a larger system that's further to the south. And they've been trying to build, um, so it has three stages of, like, first one dam, then two, and then trying to be the fourth. Um, there's a huge opposition from indigenous communities that are associated with the Zapatista movement. So I was thinking about that when you were saying that. Um, and and uh, so here you have two different kind of uh, limits to this strategy of cheap nature. One is the fact that the water is being depleted. The other one is the fact that um, these other natures, like human natures, are now rebelling against the state in particular, but also capital, uh, capital under the guise of the state, let's say. Um, and then there's, there are all these dreams that engineers in the Mexico City water system have about where they're going to get water from. Uh, one of them is building huge wells into the ground, so now we have two kilometers down, uh, and there's water there, but we have no pumps to actually get it out. <laughs> so it's there, and we think it's, well, they think it's really polluted because it's been there for thousands of years. Uh, they don't know what's in there, so um, that's one dream. The other one is to bring water from Veracruz, which is to the west, to the east, I mean. And it's, uh, it's really h higher up Mexico City, so pumping it up, it's, it's too expensive. And the state now uh, is unable to make these huge investments as it was before because of the transition of the 80s and the new state we had, which is still very repressive, but it's not geared towards internal debt or those kinds of things. And then the other one, the other, I say, a capitalist dream is to turn Mexico City into, to, so as you know, I'm sure you know, it used to be a set of five different lakes. Mexico City before the Spaniards uh, conquered it. So it was two sweet lakes, and uh, sweet water lakes, and then three uh, salt water lakes. Anyway, um, fresh water, I'm sorry. Uh, so they're trying to say, we can rebuild this project, and we will finance it by selling real estate. Uh, and these huge new apartments will pop out on the, uh, on the lake, uh, on the sides of the lake. Um, and for this, they would have to expropriate a lot of people. They would have to create a new massive movement of uh, working class people that live in the west, in the east part of Mexico City, which is where they want to build it. It will never happen. But I, what, I, what I'm saying is there is this kind of, um, kind of alternative dreams about how can you keep up capital accumulation by creating new historical natures. But um, natures are proving to be uh, even more resilient than capitalism. So uh, I think we are facing in Mexico City at least, uh, and I, I think in other places like California or even other places in Mexico like Oaxaca or Yucatan are facing uh, a real, uh, it's going to be a clash very soon between the um, limits of this ideology and practice of capitalist progress and the political, organized political alternatives like Zapatismo and all that, but then also to uh, the, the the very material limits of what can be exploited. So um, I'd give it like maybe 20 years in Mexico City to be a real, uh, at most, a real, um, a real struggle. And it's happening now. You can see how water shortages are more common and uh, uh, people are starting to use um, rainwater, but it's not enough, it's polluted. So uh, I think we're going to see a struggle between a, a new attempt on creating a capital, capitalist nature around Mexico City and around these water shortages, and then this increasing political <laughs> organization uh, loosely based on Zapatista ideologies about uh, common rule and another view of on value of nature. And I think we're going to see that struggle intensify. And it's going to be interesting because that exists most, mostly in, in rural Latin America. But I think it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in, in urban uh, Latin America. Well, Northern Latin America, yes.